Great, thank you. Dr. Disa is the Vice Chair of Clinical Activities in the Department of Surgery and the Beno Schmidt Chair in Surgical Oncology at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York. He's also the Breast Section Editor at the Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery Journal. It's a great honor to have him here. You can read the free breast implant illness related studies featured in this lecture at prsjournal.com. Please stay through the lecture, as Lily said, for what we hope will be a robust Q&A following the event. We hope to keep it an academic Q&A, and please focus on questions directed to Dr. Disa regarding things mentioned in his talk. Uh, that will be moderated as well after. Also, courtesy of PRS and PRS Global Open, we will be raffling a $100 Amazon gift card towards the end. We'll also be recording this lecture and a Q&A to post it on PRS and the Global Open websites and social media channels. If you do not want to be on the video, please find one of us after and ask us to remove you from the video. With that, we introduce Dr. Disa to talk about breast implant illness. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here in front of everybody and uh, to talk about this controversial topic. Um, I think they chose me because um, I'm not affiliated with any of the breast implant companies, nor have I been. Um, I'm the section editor, as mentioned, for the journal for PRS, and my practice is largely breast reconstruction, and it's been that way for about 23 years at Sloan Kettering. Um, the vast majority of breast implants I put in are for reconstructive surgery, not for cosmetic augmentation. Um, and I'd say of all the breast reconstruction I do, about 25% of it to 30% of it is autologous tissue and about 70%, 70, 75% of it is implant based because not everybody's a candidate for autologous tissue. So what is it? What is breast implant illness? Well, it's, it's kind of a catch bag term that's been defined by social media loosely uh, to include human adjuvant disease, autoimmune and inflammatory syndromes that are induced by adjuvants, silicone incompatibility syndrome, and sometimes more broadly to encompass all complications related to uh, silicone breast implants. And if you look at this list that was published in a supplement in PRS in uh, 2019, it's way too long to go into what all the possible things are that are related to symptom systemic symptoms associated with breast implants, but it varies between central nervous, musculoskeletal, immune, inflammatory, GI, GU, skin-related issues, psychological, and cardiorespiratory. I wrote a discussion for Dr. Rorich's et al.'s article about, the, about this very topic, and I received a bunch of emails from this particular rheumatologist in New Jersey, and so I thought it was, it was pretty interesting because he doesn't go along necessarily with the American College of Rheumatology does. Um, in the relationship between breast implants, um, but he feels very strongly and passionately that they're a problem. So I'm gonna highlight some of his papers that he sent me. So in 1997, the author implied that silicone-containing compounds alter cellular biochemistry, which leads to disruption in basic biological processes. He published a paper of 300 of, of his patients who were ill after silicone implantation, with an onset of two and a half years on average, 30 signs or symptoms per patient, and a disease acceleration at five to six years after implantation, coincident with capsule formation and implant failure. He also had 156 patients with, that were potentially ill from their silicone implants who were explanted, and about half of them got better. About 10% of them got worse after explantation. And he said that the longer the implants were in, the less likely that the patients were gonna get better. He also talked about six patients who had cohesive implants, the new cohesive gel implants, who had uh, no ruptures in their implants but had some autoimmune symptoms, and three patients had resolution after explant and three did not. He feels that when living organisms are confronted by artificial uh, organosilicone and organosilexane compounds, that it can create vague symptoms such as fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, and in other disorders that are caused by insidious, slow-paced toxicity mechanisms. So on the other end of the spectrum, there's been a bunch of studies that show that there's an absence in longitudinal changes in rheumatologic parameters after silicone implants. And this is a study from North Carolina. 218 patients study between 85 and 98, 112 with silicone and 106 with saline. In examining these patients, there was no changes uh, in C-reactive protein rheumatoid factor, anti-streptolysin titers, 
um, from pre-op to long-term follow-up in either group. And there was no difference in physical exam or subjective questionnaires in either group compared to non-implanted controls. This uh, was done, a similar study was done uh, in uh, Denmark. 190 women with silicone implants, 186 breast reductions, and 149 controls. No difference in self-reported diseases or symptoms except for breast pain, which was three times greater in implant patients compared to reduction patients and patients without implants. No difference in autoimmune antibodies. Uh, interestingly, the self-reported use of psychotropic drugs was higher in the breast pain plant patients uh, in, in Denmark. So Norm Cole published in 2018 consequences of the U.S. Food and Drug Administration's directed moratorium on silicone breast implants between 1992 and 2006. And what came out of this was that the class action lawsuits against the implant companies led a federal judge to create a four-person national science panel for determine the purpose of determining causation. The British Minister of Health also appointed an independent review group to examine possible health risks of silicone implants. And finally, Congress asked the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services to investigate potential health risks. This task was assigned to the Institute of Medicine, arguably a very high-powered and important board, who appointed a panel of 13 recognized experts. What was the conclusions from the three examining bodies? No connection exists between silicone gel implant and systemic disease. The in Institute of Medicine's article or uh, publication in 1999 said that the local complications of silicone implants, rupture, capsular contracture, infection were the primary concern, but there was not sufficient evidence to implicate silicone implants with systemic illness. Uh, a review of the literature of connective tissue disease and implants showed five studies that were evaluated and uh, the authors concluded that there appears to be little scientific basis for any association between implant rupture and well-defined connective tissue disease or undefined or atypical connective tissue diseases. They thought that the concept of silicone-related disease was developed by rheumatologists based on highly selected groups of patients uh, who had silicone breast implants that were seen in their practices. This study was published, um, another systematic review that was published actually in the Annals of Internal Medicine in 2015, a meta-analysis of 32 studies meeting eligibility criteria. Evidence was inconclusive about any association between silicone gel implants and long-term health outcomes, and better evidence is needed from larger studies. This article published uh, by Coronios et al. from MD Anderson looked at long-term outcomes in 99,993 patients. And what they found was that compared to normative data, based on the data set they had, silicone implants had a higher rate of Sjogren's syndrome, scleroderma, rheumatoid arthritis, stillbirth, and melanoma. So that article in social media in the New York Times caused a firestorm recently. And on March 25th and 26th, the FDA held a two-day conference to take another look at breast implants because of renewed safety concerns. An editorial was written based on that Coronios article by two recognized experts in the field of breast reconstruction, uh, Babak Marara and Amy Caldwell, and they pointed out the methodological flaws with the Coronios study. In fact, only 34,000 patients were included rather than 100,000 because of poor follow-up. And in fact, 25,000 Allergan patients who had physician-reported data had no association with Sjogren's, rheumatoid arthritis, scleroderma, or melanoma. And the, the patients that did have the association were mentor patients the, from the mentor data set where the reports were self-reported, not physician-reported. And adverse events were compared to normative population rates. However, the, the authors didn't match the cohorts for proper design. They also failed to control for confounders, such as geography, lifestyle, ultraviolet light exposure, smoking, alcohol use, cancer history, exposure to radiation, family history, weight, depression, medications, or reproductive history. So the results of the study were felt that they would likely be sensationalized in the media, though it should be interpreted with caution and most likely reflects methodological flaws rather than true associations with pathologic conditions. Which brings us to the study by Magnuson, uh, A Way Forward. We need more science. When analyzing the imperfections of the current state of the art, we must not succumb to pseudoscience or jump to unsupported conclusions. Better controlled, sophisticated research is required. But at the time of the writing that Gary Brody wrote in 1977, this was, un this was not available. But today, it is getting there. We do know that textured surfaces on breast implants, whether they be silicone or, or, or saline, can cause lymphoma. That's a, that's a known quantity. 
uh, we need better science to know about silicone implant related illness. And we need to study these patients. We need to use the registries. The FDA suggested that we have take new initiative on breast implant safety. We need a national breast implant registry. We need to register our patients and follow our patients. We have a registry for lymphoma with the profile database, and we're making strides towards that. So the question is, is silicone implant illness science? Is it myth? I don't know. I haven't seen in the thousands and thousands of breast reconstruction patients I've had, people coming in and having their implants removed for autoimmune phenomena. I just haven't seen it. I've had three cases of ALCL in textured implants. In my practice, it's one in 800, right? I stopped using textured implants. Um, but I think we need more data and more science about the whole breast implant illness thing. And I'm gonna use uh, the logo from our hospital about what I think needs to be done, and that's more science and less fear. So thank you very much for paying attention. I'd be happy to entertain some questions. I hope everybody keeps us respectful and academic. Perfect. And just a reminder for everybody, you can read free breast implant illness related studies featured in this lecture at prsjournal.com. And we'll get the Q&A started. Uh, and just a reminder, as Dr. Deesa said, please keep it uh, academic questions um, related to this topic. And we'll start uh, with uh, first uh, question. Thank you, Dr. Deesa, for such a, uh, a good talk on a, a relatively um, uh, big phenomena that's starting to come into current offices. I wonder if you could comment um, for young surgeons how you would cancel, counsel both the preoperative patient, whether it's uh, breast reconstruction or breast augmentation wanting an implant on uh, uh, silicone implant illness. Um, and similarly, if they come in with already having implants, how you would counsel them on if they wanting to come out? I think that, you know, in, in this day and age, you have to bring it up and talk, and talk to them about it. Um, and you can talk to them about the fact that it may be related, if it, if it d does truly exist and we're trying to figure all that out, is it related to what's inside the implant or is it related to the surface of the implant or is it related to both? I don't think we know the answer to that. And if, if it exists, and if it does, then you need to counsel them whether they want a saline implant or a silicone implant. But it should be part of your informed consent process, I believe. If a patient wants their implant out, I take it out. I don't argue with them, I, you know, it's as simple as that. You want your breast implant out, I'm happy to take it out, no problem. You know, we can talk about what your breast is gonna look like after that, whether it's reconstructed or an augmented breast, and how do you wanna deal with that, you know? But I think if they were, if it's, if it's something that they wanna do, then by all means. Yeah, I wonder if you could comment. I'm, I'm seeing uh, probably 50% of the patients, whatever, that are coming in supposedly with this uh, saline implants. So, uh, you know, and I think there are uh, physicians out there who are uh, advocating that those are a problem in a similar sense as well, whether it's saline or silicone. Any comment on that? No, other than I think that we, you know, all of our data that's coming in is, is anecdotal and it's retrospective. I think that we need to, need to have you know, a registry. We need to follow people moving forward and try to make some sense out of, out of what's going on and, and, and see what the, what the truth is behind the whole, the whole concept. Dr. Tisa, I really enjoyed your talk. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. How do you uh, handle patients that not only want their implant out, but they want total capsulectomy and block capsulectomy? What do you say to those patients? If it's a textured surface breast implant and there's a significant capsule, then I do a total on block capsulectomy. If the, I get in there and it's a, it's a paper thin, wispy capsule, I'm more than happy to try to do it anteriorly as long as it's safe. I think trying to take that off the posterior rib cage and chest wall is inherently dangerous. Bleeding, pneumothorax, you can go in and cause all kinds of problems that you know you don't need to uh, potentially, um, particularly if it's a smooth surface transplant and, they, and there's nothing to the capsule. Because um, we've all seen capsules that are like orange peels and they're you, you can easily get, take them out, and then there's other ones that are barely exist. And I think trying to take them out can do more harm than good. Thank you. And at this point, the FDA is not recommending taking the capsule off the posterior wall, chest wall, if it's a submuscular implant, if it's, a, if it's deemed by the physician that it's more dangerous to try to take it out than, than not. 
Hi, Dave Stevens in Seattle. Um, I'm, you know, we have no, we have low gel bleed implants, but I'm not aware of any studies that have been done showing the amounts of circulating silicone in saline and silicone implants versus a baseline. Is, does anybody mm -hmm. have a, an idea? Uh, I'm, I'm not aware of that data either. I don't know if anybody else in the room has any comment on that. It would be interesting to, to get that. It would be. Sure. Um, so thank you so much for your talk. I know we all enjoyed it. There's a lot of trainees here in the audience. Um, could you maybe discuss some of your techniques or your tricks in um, performing an on-block um, capsulectomy with implant removal for the patients that do require it? Uh, yeah, you need to have expo adequate exposure is number one. And so you need assistance. You need people to help. You need a good lighted retractor so you can see what's going on or a headlight. You need to be very careful with your dissection and you need to tell the patients that they're going to end up with a drain probably for 7 to 14 days because uh, they just leak all kinds of seroma. They're going to have a higher risk of a hematoma postoperatively. Um, and I think trying to do it yourself without proper assistance and proper lighting is inherently dangerous. Um, you definitely have to have good exposures. I also think, and maybe people do this in this room, but if a patient had a periareolar incision and now they need a capsulectomy, I'm going to make an inframammary incision because I think it's safer and the exposure is better and then I don't have to cut through breast tissue um, if it's an augmentation patient. Thank you all for your attention.